Hey, uh, my name is Drew Galloway. Um, I'm with the Annette Strauss Institute for Civic Life. Uh, we're an organized research unit at UT Austin. Um, we uh, really kind of study uh, research um, civic uh, health here in uh, Texas, and then we also uh, kind of, you know, from what we find, we do education and outreach based on, you know, on how to kind of tackle some of these issues that we have specifically here in Texas. So today, um, our presentation is going to be uh, based on our Texas Civic Health Index, um, which we uh, completed a couple years back in 2013. Uh, we've got, uh, this is sort of an interactive presentation, so we're going to talk a little bit about myself and Annette Strauss and that kind of thing, but then it's also interactive, we're going to do some data exercises and that kind of stuff. So uh, thank you so much to UTSA um, and the uh, Center for Civic Engagement uh, for having us here today uh, for this really important dialogue. Uh, we're really glad to be here from Austin. Um, so uh, again, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, how Texans compare to the nation on uh, civic life um, and obstacles to civic engagement uh, and then sort of hopefully crowdsource some new ideas and some existing ideas of how uh, of solutions to, to tackle that here at the local level. Um, so again, we're going to talk a little bit about me and, uh, and my work at, Civ at uh, Annette Strauss Institute. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about us and why we're gathered here today. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about now and why it's really important for us to take action on some of uh, the uh, civic health indicators here in Texas. So. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in a little small town in Georgia, um, outside of Augusta, Georgia. Um, and so I think when I was very young, when I was about six years old, I told my mom that I wanted to be a butler. And so I think she was uh, astounded at that. But you know, um, I think throughout my uh, entire adult life, I really liked serving others. Um, and so uh, when I uh, graduated high school at 17, I uh, left uh, the United States, went to Europe for a couple years and studied in Europe. I studied uh, wine and spirits. Um, I came back to the United States two years later and enrolled in the uh, Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Um, and so um, I worked in the uh, hospitality and beverage industry for about 10 years uh, up and down the East Coast and through this highly regulated government you know, or industry, um, I interacted with government from the private sector. Um, and uh, as I, you know, I worked in uh, New York, North Carolina, Florida, and other states uh, throughout the East Coast, and I always noticed that we would have a lot of uh, civic engagement or more civic engagement um, whenever I would go in front of a zoning commission panel or that kind of thing. Um, I came to Texas about uh, four or five years ago, um, and also working from the private sector, I noticed that like nobody showed up for zoning commission, nobody, you know, was, the, the turnout was really, really low. Um, so I started to kind of uh, look at this from, you know, the, 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 the private sector and, you know, ask myself why was this happening, that kind of thing. Um, I got involved at the local politics level, specifically with uh, then County Commissioner Tommy Atkinson, um, and uh, really decided to kind of go back to school and start studying public, public policy. I was extremely lucky to uh, attend UTSA um, at the College of Public Policy downtown. Um, and uh, it was a, a really great opportunity. I got to do some really incredible things, like attend the uh, Clinton uh, Global Initiative uh, University uh, in Phoenix, um, and uh, I was a member of the Honors College, and uh, I was uh, about last fall, I was chosen as a UT System Archer Fellow. Um, and so uh, part of that uh, was I had to find an internship, and so ultimately I was really, really lucky to uh, intern at the White House uh, Domestic Policy Council. And so um, I uh, spent about four months of uh, my fall semester and then at the, uh, at the Domestic Policy Council in the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. Um, and uh, I was very, very fortunate to be asked to stay on an additional month or so uh, to train new interns and uh, help out. Um, and then when I came back to Texas, ultimately uh, I found my way to the Annette Strauss Institute um, and so I'm the new politics forum co uh, program coordinator there. So I work mostly with millennials <coughs> and young uh, college-age students on civic engagement. Um, so uh, 
And Ned Strauss, uh, we st we, our mission is to understand and overcome obstacles to civic engagement. Um, we're, we were founded in 2000 at the University of Texas at, at Austin, um, and ultimately we uh, research, um, educate, and outreach to, to communities to help kind of understand and overcome these obstacles. Uh, we were named after um, Annette Greenfield Strauss, who served uh, Dallas City Council and uh, the mayor from 1987 to 91. Uh, mayor Strauss, uh, ultimately over her entire career, had 40 years worth of uh, community participation underneath her belt. So we're really happy to be kind of named after her um, and, uh, and kind of hold her namesake. Um, and uh, so ultimately, we have a research unit side uh, that does a lot of data, a lot of uh, polling, um, and, uh, and writing on civic engagement here in Texas. Um, and then we have an outreach side that uh, does educational outreach and community outreach on how we can make those changes and implement that research and, uh, and make that happen. Um, so we are based out of, the, uh, at, out of UT Austin's Moody College of Communication. Um, and from that, uh, from, from this body, we run multiple uh, programs on the outreach side. One uh, is Speak Up, Speak Out. Um, and so this is our, our middle school and high school uh, range uh, programs. So we try to you know, uh, grab students when they're young, kind of coming through uh, grade school, and uh, engage them in civics through a civic science fair, basically. They get to choose their own uh, policy issue. Uh, crowdsource solutions and then uh, compete in like a civics fair um, at UT Austin and UT Dallas um, and then ultimately we award the top winners money to help get their project started so we've had lots of different things like solar panels on libraries um, and then even bigger issues like police brutality and that kind of thing come up in this uh, science fair or civics fair and it's really really amazing um, the New Politics Forum is the program that I run. Um, this is uh, basically a program that links millennials with political, active political professionals and active uh, elected officials. Um, we uh, do mostly um, in, in order to kind of build their network uh, and encourage them to get uh, involved in uh, elected, and, and elected uh, politics, that kind of thing, once they graduate from college. Um, we have the I'm a 24 Citizen campaign, which revolves around a lot of our conferences. Uh, one of them uh, this past uh, summer was Breaking Through um, with the Knight Foundation. The Engaging News Project is um, a research uh, project that we have in Annette Strauss that deals with uh, looking at news and how news is phrased and how that impacts, uh, how that impacts the community and civic engagement. Um, UT Votes and Texas Votes is a program that we have that uh, encourages voter turnout and voter registration. And then finally, we um, house uh, the Texas uh, branch uh, of Project Vote Smart, which is actually based out of Montana. Um, but we do a lot of, uh, or our, the people that work there do a lot of uh, legislative uh, research and kind of taking uh, the legalese out of um, out of bills and turning them into common, you know, so, so that common people can understand them. Um, so in 2013, we published the uh, Texas Civic Health Index. Um, it provides a comprehensive uh, first time look at civic and political engagement in Texas, uh, who engages in their community in politics and how. Um, we uh, ran the numbers in 2012, published in 2013 in partnership with the National Conference on Citizenship. Um, and ultimately, you know, this is to educate uh, Americans about how civic life, at, about our civic life, and how to motivate citizens at the local level, level leaders and policymakers to strengthen this. So there's really three branches that we looked at in the uh, Texas uh, Civic Health Index, um, and that's where the, what we came up with that defines civic health. Um, Texas's dynamic growth um, is bringing lots of challenges, um, not only in infrastructure and water and education and immigration, um, but there's, you know, we have different ways of meeting these challenges, but they all require the public's involvement. Um, it's, an, it's absolutely paramount that we get more voices to the table. So the first one is uh, political participation, um, and so this involves uh, you know, actually getting people to register to vote, actually getting them to um, turn out, um, and 
interact with parties and interact with uh, council members, that kind of thing. So um, this is a, a very, very kind of key aspect and what most people think of when they think civic life. They think, you know, you know political participation. Um, civic involvement is the other kind of big bucket for this. Um, and so civic involvement involved is like how do you interact with your community as a whole? Uh, do you volunteer? Do you donate to uh, philanthropic or organizations? Um, and do you show up for school board meetings? And uh, do you contact your elected officials? That kind of thing. And then finally, the third bucket is social connectedness. So this involves um, do you contact your neighbors? How well do you know your community? Um, how you know often do you talk with other people outside of your kind of demographic neighborhood? Um, and so. These are sort of the three buckets and the three major kind of pillars that you're going to see whenever we're talking about civic life. So um, we come to like the we part of our presentation, which is, uh, is Texas living in an undiagnosed crisis of civic health? Uh, what is our current, you know, uh, you know, health here in Texas? And we believe that there's lots and lots of challenges. And, you know, ultimately, we believe that, uh, that Texas does have some areas that we really, really need to improve on. So um, one of the things that when we think of civic health, you know, everybody in this room is very, very engaged. You know, I'm sure that we all show up to, you know, things at city council. Uh, many of us vote. Um, a lot of us contact our elected officials when things uh, come up that we issues that we're passionate about. But um, I think that you know, as we move forward and begin to kind of look at the data from the Texas Civic Health Index, um, let's put ourselves into perspectives of average citizens. So we um, came up with a short little uh, two-minute video that kind of shows, um, when asked about civic life, what you know the average person sort of says. Like how you're reaching out to them. Well, it's responsibility to mankind. I don't know the political theory, so it's probably defined in contrast to its site and commercial. Just uh, people functioning in normal society, behaving as uh, mature adults, and uh, they're doing their best to get along. Uh, civic life to me means being a citizen, being actively engaged in what's going on around you. I'm trying to be decent about things in this world, which some people don't seem to do. I think it's civic life as your involvement with your local community and local politics, and statewide and national politics, and the level of, kind of engagement that you have with what's going on in your community and how you how you connect with it and keep it informed. I didn't, I didn't look up the word civic because I mean, every morning I'm trying to get a job, huh? Yeah. Talking about government, probably government health programs. For the population to be fully healthy, it includes a lot more to me than just actual like healthcare and stuff like that. Um, it just sort of means the health of the government, of the people, of our, the relationship between the two. Maybe communities are people collaborate together. Way. And just work as a team and work on solving problems and having solutions. Just being more optimistic and thinking that we do have representation and that people are going to listen to us and there's not going to be stalemates in government. People having like a solid say, just informed mostly. Like, uh, know what's going on and know, like, so if they don't like something, know, like, what are the channels that they can do to try to change it other than just like complaining on the internet. Communities that are happy. So civic health is just communities that are happy with what they get and what they're receiving from the government and what they're giving back to the government. Or my grandma in World War II, that's what she told me. She's like, yeah, the best thing I want all the war. You know, sometimes you just have to do it. Even though you know you're not getting to do that. Uh, civic health requires that you know a lot of people engage within the community or else uh, 
society doesn't really prosper, or even, you know, that. So as you can see, there's lots of different you know, kind of understandings of what civic health is in that kind of term. Uh, anything from one gentleman talked about like civility and like how we act uh, to each other versus like how we interact with government versus how government interacts with us. Um, so we use civic health as a metaphor, sort of like how healthy as a, as a person, uh, you know, like when climbing stairs, or running, you know, you have your heart system and you know your your neuro, neuro system and lungs, muscles, that kind of thing. That all kind of work together uh, to to kind of keep you moving and that kind of thing. Um, one of these can be weakened. Um, you know, maybe you might have a, a bad knee. You might not run as fast, but you still can run. Um, but society needs healthy systems as well. Um, so political, civic, and social again are three kind of uh, kind of points. Uh, and part of civic health, do the heavy lifting of uh, democratic self-governments. And so if these systems deteriorate too poorly, then ultimately we believe that, you know, we begin to, democracy begins to suffer because of that. Um, and so that includes uh, decreased uh, government accountability and increased uh, citizen dissatisfaction. So again, this is going to be sort of an interactive uh, presentation. So what we're going to do is uh, we've got charts from our Civic Health Index all across the room. We want you to kind of pair up into groups of three or four, uh, and then uh, we're going to answer some uh, three questions uh, on each one of these charts, and then kind of come back together and talk about what they show us and that kind of thing. So um, if you guys want to just kind of move to one of, the, one of the charts, we'll pass around markers, and then we'll go over these three questions real quick. They're all different, that's correct. Uh, this is chart A. So uh, this is age and political participation in Texas. So what did you guys uh, find uh, with, you know, what, what's the graph telling you? The graph says that um, involvement in political life has declined in multiple ways. Um, and in particular, the biggest gap, age gap that you see is that um, what, when, I mean, obviously young people don't register in the same proportion or numbers as older people, but even when they do, they're then um, considerably almost half as likely to vote even when they're registered. Um, so what it says is um, that young people don't believe in the political process. I mean, and, you know, and the only place where they exceed is they're more likely to express political opinions on the internet, but we think that only has to do with the fact that they're on the internet and older people are less on the internet. Uh, obstacles, opportunities? Um, I think the biggest obstacle is that um, young people do not believe that their vote matters. Okay. And so there's no point in voting in most elections. Um, and then what can we do about it? I um, mean, opportunities is that there is, you know, I mean, there are some who are still interested enough to vote. I, I don't know what we can do about it. That was the key, is we, we had no idea, you know, except hire people, get people, you know, who are passionate about young people and can really talk to young people and show them that their vote could matter, at least at the local level. Great, great. Any other input on this chart real quick before we move to the next one? Yes? For the obstacles, maybe one solution or, or step towards that would be organizing conversations with council people. Mm -hmm. Like Ron Nuremberg is making presentations, so, you know, yeah, there's some... things matter at the local level. Yeah. And some of the research that is showing that, like, because uh, there's sort of a public distrust in Congress um, and dissatisfaction in Congress, that's sort of trickling down. Um, and so, like, people like Hibbings and Bullock, like, they're studying, like, this trickle-down effect and how it's impacting local politicians who were, they were never really impacted by this distrust level unless they did something wrong um, and that kind of thing. So you really trusted your city council person or your mayor to, that they were doing the right thing unless you, they ran afoul on one of the issues to you. But um, there is some evidence that, um, you know, I think they call it the cranky age where the sort of like the politician or the, the press yells at the people and politicians, the public yell at politicians, and then the politicians yell at the press. And so, you know, it's, that, that's been sort of like mid-90s to now. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of research on that as well. Thank you so much. Uh, next chart is education levels and political participation in Texas. So what, uh, what, did, what did the data tell you? Oh. 
It's C. It's probably C. Yeah. It's C. Okay. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay, so yes, we had uh, our societal differently, but uh, civic involvement by education levels in Texas. Um, so just wanted a little differently, but nevertheless, uh, essentially what this graph was informing us was that as education levels increase, engagement across volunteering, donations, group associations, and public meetings also increase. Okay. Um, second question was, what were some obstacles or and or uh, opportunities? Uh, we discussed that, um, some opportunities that we have or that we've identified were redefining what the engagement process looks like and I don't know if you wanted to speak to that a little bit more or... Oh, well I was referencing uh, actually the earlier session that was held here, the two presenters were here, but we were talking a little bit about how um, just rethinking how we do civic engagement to begin with. Uh, so I think that there's a great opportunity to, to start thinking about it in that way rather than trying to fit like a circle in a box. We, we could start just, um, there's a lot of room for creativity. Now do you, one of the kind of key questions around this uh, is do you think that the reason you have a higher political participation uh, rate in uh, education levels is because of college campuses, they kind of get them together and that kind of thing? Or do you think that it's just because they graduated or? Not necessarily, I think Leo made a great point when we were discussing in our group. Uh, there's probably another story here that could be told because these percentages weren't broken down into even, I guess, more detailed categories. Mm -hmm. So we're all kind of lumping things into categories. We're not looking at the details associated with sure. each percentage point. Furthermore, uh, Leo also raised a good point about uh, our group association and our public meetings, particularly for the years 2009 through 2011. Uh, Leroy had stated that uh, these were also time periods when the United States were looking at uh, an economic recession, the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. So could that have had a play on some of the turnout with respect to these categories? Okay. Um, I want to show you this data. This is, again, from the Texas Civic Health Index. Um, but this gives us the rankings of how Texas sits with other states. Um, so we're 42nd in voter registration, even though we have a very, what we think is a very high voter registration rate of 61%. Uh, voting, we are absolutely dead last um, for voter participation. Um, for contacted or visited a, a public official, we are near last at 49th. Um, and then talked about politics with friends and family frequency, we're a little bit better at 44. Uh, but, um, but you know, if you look at partic particularly at voting and contacted a public official, we're, we're pretty uh, far down on the scale there. So those are, I think, areas that we can make significant strides on. One place I do think, one thing that hurts Texas overall, and probably a number of other states, is, you know, we're not what's considered generally, it was the, you know, the presidential elections where you tend to get higher voting rates, we're not a swing state. We don't get political advertising to the same degree that other states do, and people know that regardless of whether how many how many votes, this is going to be, this, our electoral votes are all going to go Republican anyway, so what's the point of showing up? Because it's going to happen whether I vote or not. I mean, I do think, you know, there, and I've heard others say that that whole electoral college idea um, depresses voting at least at the level of uh, presidential elections in states where your one vote doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Great, sure. Just a follow up to that response, just out of uh, curiosity to the group, do you think that's because there's far too much emphasis on national politics that that sentiment is shared throughout the public? Whereas the sentiment should be, I guess, more in line with local and state elected officials. But we have a, a legislature that's in office, what, twice, I mean once every two years, and then municipalities, uh, they don't get the same limelight that the national government does. So should the focus be tailored to the legislative process at the state and local level as opposed to the national? And furthermore, if we focus on the national, we give so much power and emphasis to the president, the executive branch, whereas that power and emphasis should be focused on the legislature, where policy is created and enacted, and in addition to that, they can veto the president, or they can enact laws that the Supreme Court has ruled as you know unconstitutional. Legislature has far more power than both the judicial branch and the executive branch. Yeah, we focus all our time and energy on the executive. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we're also getting into a question that you had brought up earlier in terms of norms. You know, what is the expectation in terms of being a good citizen? 
And, you know, years ago, the good citizen was the voter who just went and, and voted. And so when you have, when you're feeling your vote is not making any impact, you don't do it. But there's been a trend, I think, in changing what a good citizen is to being more engaged and questioning how is the system, the civic system, set up. So when I heard your question, I went more towards, well, what can we do to change the system? What can we do to change the, how the electoral functions so that more people will vote? Great. You had one? I had uh, two short ones. The comment that she made about the electoral college, I think the apathy really was created from Gore B. Bush mm -hmm. because they saw that this was a popular vote, this was an electoral vote. And then the numbers that you have over here about how we rank, those are almost identical to how we rank education-wise. That's a great correlation. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, two comments. I mean, there's also you know laws that make it harder for people to vote. They are being processed or being introduced. Mm -hmm bills, etc. So how, how do you change that narrative as well? And two, yeah, a lot of people don't vote also because they're disappointed on the electoral college vote, but because they don't understand how it works. If I ask my mom how it works, she'll give me an idea, but she's not going to understand how it fully works. Mm -hmm. And three, I think there's a lot of interest groups, mm -hmm. and even the super PACs at the national level, mm -hmm. that have tremendous power over the political people, over the political system, and citizens are not engaging. Mm -hmm. I mean, you worked in, in, in the Hawaii House. I'm a former archer as well, mm -hmm. and I never got calls uh, asking you what was going on in your districts. It was more calls complaining, and they hung up. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you engage these people as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would I would say that there's a whole range of forces that lead people to believe voting doesn't matter. Electoral college is one. You know, the other is the sense that money controls politics. So if I don't have it, you know, it's special interest. Yeah, yeah. And, and then recent Supreme Court decisions that have reinforced that notion that money controls politics. Well, that the national will doesn't really matter. A poll can show we all, you know, 80% of us want X, but that's not the people we've elected into office, and we don't get the choice often to elect someone who does share our beliefs on the things that matter, because that person's not running gerrymandering of districts, you know, where, um, you, you know, you water things, you know, water things down, making it harder. The whole voter ID thing, it's like, they don't want me to vote. You know what? I'm just not going to. Well, they took civics out of public education. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Three things that we found. Texas, uh, Texas still teaches government. Not civics. It's different. Mm -hmm. Three things that we found uh, sort of kind of you know explain some of uh, these uh, these numbers were non-competitive elections here in Texas, um, inconvenience of voting, and uh, shrinking, changing media coverage, which kind of alludes to everybody focusing on the presidential election and less at the local range, less on Congress, that kind of thing. Um, so we've got about uh, 10 minutes left, so we're going to kind of quickly move through a bunch of these. Um, so uh, let's see here. Us, sorry, these, uh, let's see. Let's, uh, chart D back there didn't have anybody. Who's on chart E? What? We, we have this one. Yeah, what is it? Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Really, uh, not surprisingly, um, folks age 30 and above were more civically involved. Um, across the board, you saw the least participation, regardless of age, was in public meetings, and um, folks were more likely to donate time than money. Um, in terms of um, what we, what the opportunities are, um, increasing accessibility and awareness of public meetings, and um, and then I think something Councilmember Nuremberg talked about earlier, which was um, going because there is higher participation in group association, taking the questions to where to where people are and engaging them there. Um, and then um, we talked a little bit about using technology, um, designating representation from the group associations to get them um, to participate publicly and then uh, engaging college students in, um, in public meeting participation so that they get familiar with it and feel empowered to, to weigh in. Great. Uh, next up is the, that back chart there. So since nobody was on that chart, this is civic involvement by education level. And so as you can see, it trends towards the same thing as, uh, as political participation at education level. Um, but as you can see, as they, as you get a college degree or some college, 
Uh, volunteering jumps up, donating in part, uh, partly jumps up as well because of uh, probably increase, make more money. Yeah, make more money. Um, and then, uh, but the, the things that, you know, I think the two buckets that are most interesting uh, are group association and public meetings. Because uh, you, if you have a college degree, 17% of that population uh, is involved in public meetings. Um, and then high school uh, diploma is 2.8. So, you know, I guess we're teaching maybe in government class and college, that kind of thing, how to get involved. So the, that, that's kind of telling as well. Yes, sir. Actually, that was our chart right there. Was that? Yeah, okay. sorry for the confusion. No, sorry, <laughs> sorry, it looks like we got some mix-ups on the charts. But, uh, but yeah, so, so ultimately, like volunteering, donation, uh, group association, public meetings, these are the buckets that we used for uh, civic involvement. Um, so again, some numbers from the Civic Health Index. Uh, volunteering, we are 42nd out of 51. Uh, charitable giving, we are 43rd out of 51. Uh, belongs to one or more groups, we're 37th, so that's uh, so we're, we're getting a little higher there. And leadership role in an organization is 39th. Um, we also, if you want to take a look at the breakouts of where Texans volunteer, as you can see, a big chunk of that is in religious organizations, but also uh, educational, social services uh, have a fairly big chunk there as well. Okay, so the last two charts are trust people, uh, trust people in your neighborhood. Do we have anybody there? Yeah. yeah. We talked about how there's a correlation between trust and level of income, that the higher average level of, of neighborhood income, the higher uh, reported trust, and conversely, at the lowest level, there is the lowest level of trust for your neighbors. The broader base of lower income citizens seem uh, hamstrung or disinclined to participate civically, uh, if you take that as an indicator, and then um, what to do. What to do was, yeah. yeah it, it, um, more education, it seems that also education has an impact on the level of trust and uh, more, just more education and community engagement program to strengthen city life. Great, great. Any quick comments on this chart? I think as you get higher up the, uh, the scale in pay, you can begin to choose your neighbors um, selectively sometimes. So we're seeing some of that of like, you know, moving further outside the city, moving into suburbs or into uh, like walled communities, that kind of thing. So maybe that has to do with some trust as well. Um, and then the final chart is chart F, which is talk with neighbors frequently by education level. Well, um, we were left with lots of questions on this one. Sure. And one is, what are they talking about? You know, is this, hello, hi, how are you? Um, and we don't know anything else beyond their education. We don't know gender, we don't know uh, economics, we don't know um, age, um, neighborhood setting, the culture, or, and, and so it was difficult to really form. It's, it's sort of a broad bucket, and so, right. so we, we are beginning to break some of that out, but, uh, but it, it is a fairly broad bucket of like, you know, mainly, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, uh, over half the population that walk past their neighbor's house every day and say absolutely nothing to them. Not like, mm -hmm. hey, your mailbox is down or your dog is out or like, hey, how's it going? So mm -hmm. they don't say anything whatsoever to them. Um, and so we think that there, or, you know, there's the possibility that there's a correlation between trust in your neighborhood and mm -hmm. how much you talk with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so yeah. Uh, these are the uh, Texas rankings for social connectedness. We're 41st in uh, see or hear from family or friends, uh, 16th in exchange favors with neighbors, so we're doing great, great work there. Uh, trust most or all of people in your neighborhood, 47th, and talk with neighbors, 32nd. Okay? Uh, you can go ahead and have a seat. We're going to kind of wrap up. Thank you so much for, you. for joining in on that. Um, so I, I guess the bigger question is how can we improve? Um, what, you know, what kind of matters uh, and what moves the needle? Um, and so a couple of the things that we kind of concluded in, our, uh, in the Texas Civic Health Index is uh, improving uh, liter civic literacy throughout schools. Uh, so well-constructed, well-talked uh, civics curriculum. Uh, Texas is one of the nine states that both, the, both require course completion and assessments in civics. Um, and participate in hands-on interactive learning experiences, like get kids to City Hall, that kind of thing makes a huge, huge impact. 
Um, the second thing is uh, increasing access to higher education. Obviously, there's a correlation for the higher, the more educated you are, the more active you are in the community. So. Um, Ed educated Texans are more likely to vote, more likely to express views to families, friends, and elected officials, and more leisure time, which means more opportunity to serve volunteer domain. Um, third, uh, we've got increasing the supply and demand for public affairs information. So citizens need accurate inf information to fulfill civic duties, um, and so broadening the uh, amount of uh, different channels of information, whether that's internet, whether that's uh, via you know, uh, community television, or that's the big news outlets, um, you know, more information is better, and uh, nonprofits like League of Women Voters, Sunlight Foundation, and uh, Project VoteSmart are kind of fulfilling this gap. And then uh, finally, embracing new platforms for engagement. So 66% um, of social media users, quote, post their thoughts about civics, civic and political issues, react to other postings, press friends to act on issues and vote, and follow candidates. Um, so mobile and network uh, communication eliminates barriers, um, and then innovative platforms like uh, C-Click Fix uh, help fix uh, municipal issues like traffic lights, uh, fire hazards, that kind of thing. Um, for lower socioeconomic neighborhoods, uh, uh, technologies like SMS, like text messaging, that kind of helps out as well. And, provides instant feedback to elected officials. Um, so, what can you do to encourage a healthier civic life in Texas? This is where the now comes in. So, obviously we've kind of uh, identified some obstacles and opportunities for us to do, for us to tackle. Um, so it's ultimately up to the people that's in this room and our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues at work to go out and kind of tackle this issue. Uh, it really can't be necessarily like a top-down strategy. It's got to be a bottom-up strategy. Um, so things that we can do to, to encourage a healthier civic life in Texas are uh, voting. So you can host debate parties, uh, election night parties. You can get involved with, uh, get informed about candidates and talk to uh, candidates and elections uh, to other friends. Uh, remind your friends <coughs> to vote. Um, the second bucket is uh, engaging your elected officials. So pick up the phone and talk to your elected official. Uh, call, write, uh, visit. Uh, join a nonprofit that advocates on issues that you're passionate about. Um, and then write letters to the editor or use social media to spread new ideas. Um, and then the third bucket is uh, building social capital and civic involvement. And so this involves like reaching out to neighbors, uh, crossing lines of diversity, uh, that, that can be geographical, age, gender, race, ethnicity, and educational levels, which we've all measured in the Texas Civic Health Index. Talk with your family and friends about issues that you care about. And address needs in the community by bringing together neighbors. So rather than tackling an issue uh, by yourself or with a, with a small uh, nonprofit group, bring your neighbors in together. It brings more voices and that kind of thing. So additional resources, you can download the Texas Civic Health uh, Index uh, at texascivichealth.org. Uh, you can visit our website, which is annettestrauss.org, uh, for more information on our programs, that kind of thing. Uh, we do have an infographic available that we've passed out, but if I missed you, please come snag one or a handout, uh, grab a couple if you'd like to hand out to your friends. Um, on annettestrauss.org, there's snapshot of everyday voices videos um, to help kind of you know guide this conversation of like the average citizen and everything. Um, and then also you can download civic life gra uh, graphics that you can share on social media and kind of start the conversation with your friends and everything. Um, so my name is Drew Galloway. Uh, thanks so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your interaction. Everybody was really great. Are there any questions? Uh, we've got like two minutes left.